any advice that I could give to somebody who is starting? Uh, of course, you can uh, maybe first uh, need to do some homework, maybe um, find some material online and maybe have uh, some basic information. But probably the best starting point is to talk to people, people that they already have a little bit of experience, uh, try to get information for them and maybe uh, try to narrow down because it's too wide topic, narrow down to what's your requirement and maybe try to get the expert on that so that they can help you. And I think it's a great community in general, so everyone is uh, very happy to help and discuss on those topics. So that's definitely a good starting point, I would say. Yeah. We have found that it's not about learning, that's the beginning part, but it's the understanding is how you apply what you have learned and that comes from real world practice. And, and that's where the hands-on comes in. That's where they're trying some designs and thinking about the principles as you're doing that design, thinking about how they apply is so valuable. Uh, and then you see what works and doesn't work. And, and you begin to see how to use that learning that you've got in real world applications. And, and I think that's really the, 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 the part of the revolution that's happening these days, especially the maker community, is that combination of the, the learning part, the textbook, you go through the formal part of it, you understand the math, um, but it's when you pull it all together that you understand the, the big picture, you understand how to use that, formal, that formalism of electrical engineering into building real products. What works in other It's not that the real world doesn't, doesn't the, the textbook doesn't apply to the real world, it absolutely does, but you have to uh, learn how to apply it to the real world. And when you can marry what you learn in the classroom and the textbook with what you learn in the real world, then you become the most powerful engineer and you're able to accomplish the most. This is my favorite subject. Uh, I call this the holistic ecosystem. And so what I teach in my workshops is that we have to do this holistically. You can't design power integrity without worrying about signal integrity and EMI. And here's a fascinating statistic. My company did six workshops around the country last year in conjunction with Rodian and Schwartz. And one of the questions we asked everybody in the workshop is, um, what is your area of specialty? This is a power integrity workshop. 10% of the people in our workshop were related to power. 90% of the people in our power integrity workshop were not. I mentioned this to Eric Bogadin before his uh, tutorial here yesterday, and he asked the same question in his tutorial. How many people here are power integrity people? 10%. And so what this tells us is that power engineers design their power supply. They don't really worry about anything else. They throw it over the wall. The signal integrity guys and EMI guys say, oh my God, it doesn't work. And they come to the workshop to learn how to fix it. These three areas all do affect each other, and the conclusion of my keynote, which was about what challenges are we gonna face in 2023? And I said, in 2023, we just get a little bit more concentrated than we are now. Circuits get smaller, performance requirements get higher, budgets go lower, design cycles get shorter. There's no way in 2023 that you just get by. You either have an optimum design or you don't. There's not gonna be just get by. And so what that means is that these three areas, SIP, I, and EMI are gonna learn, need to learn how to talk to each other. And one of the ways that we'll do that is through simulation. And that's one of the reasons that I work so closely with Heidi Barnes at Keysight is that we can tie all of these areas together through simulation. And ADS is a very powerful simulator that's capable of, of assessing power integrity, signal integrity, and EMI simultaneously. Oh, we're full of those <laughs> design guidelines, right? I mean, you can go in here and you can see like all these different roll of thumbs, right? And all these different things that, you know, that people talk and those comes from measurements and from experience and sometimes, you know, People agree with those roll of thumbs. Sometimes people disagree, you know. Sometimes there are little times where the roll of thumbs cannot be really applied. So it's not so much about the roll of thumbs. It's really about like the knowledge to apply those roll of thumbs when they should be applied. That's a, a big question. I, I have a two-day seminar on that topic. But uh, in, a, in a nutshell, um, a lot of the EMI issues um, are uh, revolve around the circuit board design. 
And so I'm incorporating more uh, circuit design uh, content within my seminars. And um, basically, uh, it, it is really important to, um, for every signal layer, there needs to be a, a signal return plane adjacent to it. And if you don't have that, if you have a stack up like, uh, and this is typical of, of, my, of the clients that I talk to, they have signal, ground, signal, signal, power, signal. And so the top half, signal, ground, signal, is fine, but the signal's reference to the power plane is, um, you know, that, that was okay back in the 80s and 90s, but we're decades past that, and the clock frequencies are so fast now that you can't uh, reference your signal to other than signal return. And so uh, you, you need more ground return planes in the circuit board now. And um, so some companies are finally realizing that, and I think most people here attending DesignCon understand that. But it's the designers in the trenches that don't get out to DesignCon that are having the issues, really. So advice for the print circuit board manufacturers and designers is something I think I, I usually say in my interviews is don't forget about the ground return. <laughs> ground is just as important as signal and I, I think that's the worst thing that a lot of our schematics do. You pay attention to all your net, uh, net listing of your signals and ground is something off in the corner. It really is important how the ground return follows. Uh, Power integrity is a great example. You think you're down at DC. It's not AC, it's not RF, not microwave. But the currents are so high, the impedance is so low, that that ground return inductance and a little bit of resistance there, it can actually start to impact you. And, and ground return again is very significant for power integrity. I would suggest, as a board designer myself, I've designed test boards. And before I started, I didn't really understand a single pulse, a single pulse response, let alone uh, signal and signal integrity. But the more I learn about signal integrity, the more I understand all the inner workings of the trace and the signal and the return and the electric currents. So there's a lot more than just trace that meets the eye. It's, you're not just routing traces as a designer. So I would suggest all the PCB designers to learn a little bit about signal integrity because that would dramatically improve how you're thinking about designing. And to, to plug over here, I write a blog called Tim's Blackboard. I'm responsible for that. And if you do a Google search on Tim's Blackboard, that's the first thing that pops up. It's got a lot of great educational content. I strongly suggest you check it out. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me.